Juju train. Go then. Juju train. What else would you like to say? And wheels on the bus go round. Go then. Wheels on the bus go round. Um, and can you say the EdTech podcast? The EdTech the bus. <laughs> Try again. The EdTech podcast. The EdTech the bus. <laughs> Try like this. EdTech. To the book bus. Podcast. EdTech to the book task. <laughs> everyone and welcome to this latest episode of the EdTech podcast. I've just returned from an amazing trip to the Global Education and Skills World Forum. Funnily enough, the weather in Dubai, apparently it rained when the plane landed and was very windy and having now got back to the southwest of England, um, the sky is glorious and, and it's quite warm so that's all very confusing. Um, but yes, as I mentioned, it was an amazing event um, as per last year and a fantastic chance to meet some of the EdTech podcast listeners. So big shout out, for example, to Armando Sanchez from Venezuela, um, who listens in from the company Progra Academy. Yeah. And also it was a great chance to catch up with some old friends and past interviewees and also interview some people from around the world, including uh, Tanzania, India, Kenya and Canada. Um, so I'm now busy um, editing and ordering all those recordings and uh, no doubt you'll hear from them all on the EdTech podcast soon. I was also um, extremely moved and inspired by some of the um, sessions that were held at the Global Education Skills World Forum, uh, not least the um, the winner of the prize, Peter Tabici, a maths and physics teacher from Kenya, who moved his, his job. He, he gave up his work in a private school to work in a a more deprived area, basically giving up 80% of his salary um, and setting up a peace club, a peace club and a, and a STEM club. Um, and yeah, the first winner from, from Kenya. And I was uh, lucky enough to be sat right behind um, his father. So his, so Peter's uh, mother died when he was 11. Um, I sat behind uh, his father, his sister and his cousin when he won. And um, yeah, they gave, you could see how much it meant to them. Um, so really looking forward to hopefully getting him on the show at some future date. Um, and also um, I would encourage everyone to go and um, look up the work of Mark Pollock, who um, has already said he's keen to get on the show. So looking forward to welcome, welcoming Mark. Uh, Mark uh, was sort of blind and, and had an accident and then also became paralysed. Um, but he's using um, sort of the latest biotechnology uh, to get himself uh, up and running again. Um, he's also a keen cyclist and he had an amazing view on life in terms of realism rather than blind optimism and keeping focused and motivated and also uh, sharing and, and, and kind of getting the, the amazing cutting edge research that's happening in the basement of places like UCLA um, out and connecting that to real world problems. So yeah, looking forward to sharing Mark's work soon. But uh, for this episode, uh, one of my duties during uh, GESF this year was moderating a panel of teachers and plus global uh, Teach Prize top 50 winners on what they want from EdTech. So this discussion forms this week's episode and you'll hear from teachers in, in wildly different scenarios. So I think we have a teacher from uh, Japan, Belgium, Kenya and Chile who are all using technology to expand their practice. Um, so I hope you enjoy this episode. Do obviously uh, message in um, on Twitter and Instagram at podcast edtech, or you can use the uh, voicemail recording system on theedtechpodcast.com. And we try and include as many of those uh, recordings as we can. So uh, make sure that you feedback there and we can include them in forthcoming episodes. Um, as always, if you're interested in sponsoring um, our forthcoming episodes, do get in touch as we're sort of organising the scheduling for those in the coming weeks. 
Um, and finally, a huge thank you to the Varki Foundation and the Tomorrow Institute, Sunny Varki, Vikas Pota and Carla Ertz and their teams for bringing everyone together once again uh, over the last week. Um, so that's it for now. I uh, hope you enjoy this episode whenever or wherever you're listening in uh, and have a great week. Bye bye. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. We're going to have a fantastic discussion now. Um, as Mike mentioned, my name is Sophie Bailey. I'm the founder and host of the EdTech podcast. And our mission is to improve the dialogue between ed and tech for better innovation and impact. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here with four teachers from around the world. Uh, I think we've got uh, Chile, Belgium, Japan and Kenya uh, represented. So we're going to dig into what teachers uh, want from ed tech. And I'm sure that's going to be highly useful to everyone in the room. Um, so to kick off, or, or really just to kind of set the context, perhaps we could all uh, share the context in which you're teaching, um, and then we can dig into a little bit about uh, what you want from EdTech. So Cohen, perhaps you could <coughs> kick off. Okay. So I teach in two Belgian schools. Uh, the first one, I teach web design, and the second one, I teach in the teacher training department. I basically teach uh, future teachers how to use technology in a classroom in a, in a good way. Uh, so it has a lot of benefits. Um, and then, apart from teaching in the school, I also launched several educational projects on a global scale in which we are using technology to make learning global and to, to foster connections between students from across the world. And we are focusing on the UN SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and, uh, during those projects. Yeah. Thank you. Mabzi, how about yourself? Um, um, Abdi Kadir Ismail. A principal at Mwangaza Muslim Secondary School in Maralal in Samburu, Kenya. Uh, Maralal is in the northern part of the country. It's um, quite rural. And um, what I do in that school is, other than being the principal of the school, I also teach. And I use technology, the very basic technology in teaching and learning. And we try to encourage our teachers also to use basic technology, where we will have technology as an assistant to the teacher and not a replacement, to complement what they do so that we can have a more reach to our students. I also do training for teachers under British Council and sometimes with Microsoft, and where we take them through basic use of technology and how to use technology in the classroom. Okay, thank you. I'm Mio. Um, my name is Mio Horio. I teach English at Shiga Prefectural Maibara Senior High School in Japan. And it is located almost the center of Japan and in the countryside, um, close to Kyoto. But I teach at the community with a population of about 40,000 in its countryside. And the challenges we are faced with is that um, we don't have much connection to the world, even though I teach English. So students have less motivation in learning English. And I use technology, mainly Skype or some tools, to connect the world with, connect my students with the world. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm Mario. Hello, I'm Mario from Chile. I, I teach science. We have two principal difficulties in Chile. We have not enough uh, labs for teach science, and we don't have uh, too much uh, time or, or money to make it some labs. So um, technology can help us in two lines. Principal, uh, have enough labs behind the screen and uh, show up topics like um, periodic table or cell division. And I have a work related with that. Okay, and then, and then your school, what, could you describe a little bit like the context that you're working in? Is it in the city or is it in a more rural setting? I work in a suburban in the, in the capital city with 85% um, of vulnerability. So it's a really poor community. We don't have enough uh, money for labs or technology. Okay. okay, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, where everyone's coming from. But I suppose the broad question today is what do teachers want from EdTech? So what do you want from EdTech? And conversely, what don't you want? So what do you find not useful? Um, anyone have any strong opinions on uh, what, what you want from EdTech? Who's going to jump in? Okay. Um, 
I want technology for, uh, to, as a starter, uh, technology can mean a lot to teachers, uh, can support, maybe even replace in the future, uh, can visualize stuff, uh, can foster collaborative learning. Uh, I think there are very different ways we can use technology in a classroom. And some of the applications will make sure that you are enhancing learning, but what we really want is, is transform learning, transform the learning uh, process of our students, basically. So what I'd like to do in my classroom is making sure that very important skills are addressed, like collaborative learning and critical thinking and problem solving and, and, and empathy even. Empathy is a really tricky one, how to bring empathy in a classroom. I think you can do that with technology uh, and the right setting. But the most important part is that there is always a pedagogy. And I think we have to focus on pedagogy and then have to make the right match with certain technology. And many teachers are doing this in a wrong way. They're trying to connect or match technology with, directly with the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And that's a wrong thing to do. Yeah. So you've talked before about uh, teachers needing to be pedagogical engineers and sort of mm -hmm. taking some of the ed tech tools but matching it yeah. with the pedagogy that makes sense in that context. I think they have to be because in most cases technology is, is not designed for education, you know. Skype wasn't built for, to, to be used in a, in, a, in a classroom. It was built to make a connection with, with family and friends. But what teachers have to do is find out, can I use the, uh, Skype or mm -hmm. Minecraft was, was created as, as a game, some kind of, of a game. And that's why teachers began to think about how to bring those tools in my classroom. Yeah. Well, that's, that's one really interesting point that I've noticed across all of your work and, and some of the pitches um, this morning as well. Um, is this idea of connectivity and using sort of mainstream communications tools mm -hmm. and apps to, uh, I suppose, enhance that relationship, whether it's with, between parents and students or students and their teacher. So, for example, I know you mentioned Skype and it being able to connect you with the rest of the world, and I know that you've done work with WhatsApp and, and being able to um, actually connect parents and students into what they're doing and, and share sort of workings uh, for maths problems and that kind of thing. So could we dig into a little bit about, you know, whether ed tech needs to specifically be um, developed for the education market or whether you're finding success in using mainstream tools as well? Um, according to me, I don't think we should tailor ed tech to just education. We should leave it open so that we have different people. There are different ab abilities that we want to appeal to. Even when we are teaching, we consider multiple intelligences in the classroom. There are students who will prefer to have visual. There are students who prefer doing things. So the same thing with technology. So if, if the technology is user-friendly, if the technology is um, able to reach more people, I am sure our students will just go into the technology and the work of the teacher will be to look at which technology is available here so that we can now uh, jump onto it and work with it. It's easier that way because we will be working from the perspective of the learner instead of working from the perspective of the teacher. It should not be teacher-led. Mm -hmm. It should be learner-based. Well, it's interesting because um, I interviewed <coughs> a, um, a lecturer recently at a UK university, and she was saying a similar thing, that she found that her students um, actually said that they wanted to communicate through the um, Snapchat messenger platform. Um, and so she started sort of messaging back and forth and there, and, and it, was, you know, it really helped to get some of the quieter students or more international <coughs> students into the conversation. Um, Mario, am I right in thinking that some of your work is more around sort of games-based learning and that kind yeah. of thing? Could you tell us, could you share with the audience some of yeah. what you're doing and the ed tech that you like to engage with? Well, I have a lot of uh, students who are gamers. So <laughs> well, something in common. And we work uh, with some video games to learn something. So uh, related with your question, maybe uh, the teachers must find technology and bring it to the school. Whatever technology can be used for, teach, uh, for teaching in our subjects. So uh, we need uh, more standardization in programming, I think. We start with uh, QR codes. Mm -hmm. uh, these QR codes are standard, universal. But when we go to augmented reality, 
all apps are different. Mm -hmm. We need an app specifically for every topic. It's not a, a universal code for augmented reality, for example. So it's really difficult. We need a lot of different apps to use augmented reality. Uh, we need uh, work in uh, universal programming for that, for example, or other topics. It's kind of like the, um, the age-old question, isn't it? How do you, you know, you've got this um, sort of wealth of ed tech tools out there. How do you discern which one's going to be useful? Um, I know that you've talked about some of the pedagogical frameworks that mm -hmm. might help with that, um, that might be worth sharing as well. Well, I, I don't think there's a good framework which decides which tool to use, you know? Mm -hmm. Every teacher and every student has, has a different need. There's no holy grail. Um, it depends on the age of the students, the financial background, um, the subject you teach, etc. So I, I really believe that the teacher has to be a pedagogical engineer and he or she gets to decide which tool to use. But um, there is an interesting uh, academic framework uh, that's a DPEC model which helps teachers to decide to connect certain technology to certain uh, pedagogy. And there's also a very interesting framework, uh, the SAMR model, S-A-M-R, which will help to evaluate whether you're, the, the tool you are using is really um, enhancing or transforming learning. So the S from substitution, like we know so many schools who bought a lot of lab, uh, iPads and all they do with the iPad is, is just replacing the, the textbooks. That's it. That's not that good. <laughs> That's the S, the substitution, you know. But there is also like uh, Mio maybe uh, using Skype to connect children with other children across the world. That's the R from redefinition. Mm -hmm. yeah. She wouldn't be able to do that without this technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure we've got a lot of um, EdTech ed tech entrepreneurs and developers in the audience. So what would you like to see more of from EdTech? I mean, if people are going to uh, devote their, their kind of life and their, their energy and time to um, developing these solutions and products, where do you think uh, is a good use of that time in terms of developing new <coughs> solutions? Well, for me, uh, I think we have, we've had enough electric ELOs, electronic uh, learning devices and, and environments. I think we are good with uh, technology which, which offers knowledge, you know. We have YouTube, we have lots of websites, blogs, etc. My thing is, is collaborative learning. I really like to find out how to uh, promote collaboration using technology. Um, but I think that um, what would, would be really interesting uh, for the future is, is adaptive learning uh, mm -hmm. environments in which uh, AI will help to decide uh, um, which approach every student deserves and needs uh, and to how to in individualize and, and personalize learning, yeah, for me. Yeah. Okay, Abdi, how about yourself? Um, for me, I think I look more at um, <coughs> one affordability and reach. How far can it reach people and how affordable it is it? Um, when I look at some of these technologies that we use, like with our parents and our children, they don't even know how to read the user guides, and they don't need them. So that is part of the, of the user friendliness that I want to see in whatever technology that comes into place, mm -hmm. so that uh, it can help us to reach more people and be affordable to them. And thirdly, it can keep data that will inform us on what it is that we are achieving or not achieving. And it should be mobile. Yeah, because we were, you were explaining to me before, um, you know, how you set up the sort of connectivity in the school through hotspotting and, and things like that. Could you describe that so people can, can understand that, you know, it's not a, necessarily um, the ed tech environment that they would be imagining? Yeah, in my case, I, I work with students and um, we have two laptops in the school. Uh, again, it's 254 students and the laptops belongs to us. It's mine and my deputies. So we can decide if we want to use it with the students or not, because it's personal. Um, we also talk to our teachers because they have their phones, and I use my phone as a hotspot for the school. So I connect, I connect on hotspot, and then the students and the teachers can use either the teacher's phones or the two laptops that are there, and they can do their basic research and do whatever it is that they want. Because for me, I believe they will get more knowledge than I can provide, and the teachers can provide, 
because there are thousands of teachers in the world online every other time, and there's a lot of resource that they can get there. And another thing is that I know in their future, they will be doing things online, and they need this information and this knowledge at that time. I don't care so much what they are learning, but if they can understand the concept, the content will come. Mia, what would you like more from EdTech? <coughs> so, um, talking about Japan, um, tech, I think technology can be the solution to the problem that teachers have. Um, so, in my, in my case, uh, we have less connection to the world, but without technology, it was impossible to connect students with the world. But with technolo technology, um, we could um, connect my students with the world, and that enables my students to broaden their minds. So before that, they had a kind of strong bias against other nationality or other country, but through the real authentic connection, they could learn the real voice, and that they learned that what they learned through some textbooks or some news was not always true. And as for Japan, I want to um, have more connection to edtech to the school because currently it's independent. So mm -hmm. um, teachers think about technology by themselves and edtech companies think about using technology in the school by themselves. So we want more connection. Yeah. Well, that is quite an interesting one. How many out of, out of you have been involved in any kind of co-curation or co-development uh, process with EdTech organisations? That's interesting. Okay. Uh, well, look, here, here we go. Um, and um, are you finding that, you know, obviously with Japan, they had the coding curriculum and that kind of thing um, coming in. Is, is there still a great focus on STEM or STEAM in Japan, or is it kind of broadening out into other forms of uh, ed tech development? Well, um, very, to be very honest, we are working toward that currently. Mm -hmm. So the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Economy are trying to embody um, what we can do with using technology in the classroom, but it's not, uh, it's just starting. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sadly. Well, that's an interesting question, I suppose, is, um, you know, in each of your countries, uh, or the countries where you travel around the world, what are you finding is the general appetite towards ed tech? Um, so, for example, are there any government initiatives in terms of supporting the development of impactful ed tech, uh, or is it more um, conservative in that way? I think uh, some countries have fear about technology in mm -hmm. the classroom, and our kids are digital born. So, for them, it's natural, the technology. So, we need work in two fronts. One, with our kids, uh, teach them about security in the websites, in the digital world. And the other front is with adults. We need to teach them to lose the fear about technology. About, uh, we, we are examples of successful uh, methodologies with technology. So we need to share this. Mm. Yeah, I think um, most, there's still a taboo in education, you know. So I think when teachers decide that they are going to use, for instance, like Mario, uh, Minecraft in the classroom, you have to, you're sure about the fact that the students will know more about Minecraft than you do. And that's really, really a, a major thing for teachers. So, mm -hmm. so why they don't uh, dare to try out or, or to jump. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's moving towards that peer-to-peer -peer learning rather than it being a uh, yeah, kind of authoritarian yeah. mm -hmm relationship, as it were. Um, and then you, you talked to, uh, previously as well about using IDEA, the platform for sort of digital badges as well. So yeah. um, could you share a little bit about how that's been useful? Um, <clears throat> the IDEA badges, um, we have students doing digital entrepreneurship. And um, with digital entrepreneurship, they're learning how to design a product, how to uh, pitch the product, how to market the product. And that's the reality of the world, because they will, need, they will need this knowledge even beyond the schools. So with idea product uh, uh, badges, we started it with our students this year. Uh, we registered 20 of them, and we were using our own mobile phones in the staff room and, and the laptops to register the students. We started by getting them to have an email address. So some of the things that we never expected we will learn from this, we ended up learning that even some of the teachers did not know how to, 
have their own email addresses. It was opened in a cyber cafe, and they are learning it from the students. So there is collaborative learning that is happening now between them, and the students are learning how to come up with a product. It's, it's a very interesting um, thing because the students are learning very basic things, and we as teachers are also learning, for instance, on issues of personal statement. Now I can understand why sometimes I, I say things and uh, I don't get support. It's because I have over-concentrated on myself than the product. I, I am speaking so much about who Abdi is and not what the product that appeals to the other person is all about. So our students are coming to understand this. And, and we told them, it is not about making your grades better in this. We want to give you an opportunity to make you better, not the grade. We are not interested in the grade, we are interested in you as the student. So that tomorrow you can fit into the world and you can do better in the world. And it is something that we are seeing as uh, coming out very well. It's a project I'm working together with another colleague who is a top 50 uh, called Dr. Maina Gyoko. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that there are a lot of people in the room, and if you would like to ask a question uh, now, before the end of the session, then, then please do, and we can come back and forth. We've got one here, Aldo, at the front. Yeah, thank you uh, very much uh, for all your testimonies. I'm uh, Aldo, I'm the founder of Teach Pitch, um, and we indeed focus on curation uh, and digital skills, so I think there are fits on many levels. Sorry, I don't want... Don't want to promote myself, uh, uh, but I, I do have I do have a concrete question in in terms of what doesn't work. I would be very interested um, to have your ideas on. Okay, this here's what started, and here's what did not resonate with me personally or within my school when it comes to technology. Um, what we have been doing is, is flip the, flipping the classroom. So every teacher started to record videos and screencasts, as you know, um, to cover the, the curriculum. And that worked fine. Uh, students are able to find their own path. Uh, it's a great way to individualize learning. Um, and the students really love this. But at a certain amount, at a cer certain stage, we overdid it. So they had a teacher in the morning for four hours. And he told the, the students, well, they watch this video, this video, this video, this video. And the teacher after. So after the noon, uh, at, at the evening, did the same. So the students ended up by listening for eight hours to videos. Yeah. And then when they asked the question to the teacher, the teacher didn't have any clue because there are so many videos, you know? So I don't know what you're learning right now. Yeah. So I think uh, my message is don't overdo it. Um, and also, McDonald's is already able to digitize the whole process. They can run restaurants without any human being, but still the audience wants human beings. They want to be served, and I think the students want the same, basically. Yeah, so don't overdo it. And my message would be concentrate on learning and not on teaching. Don't design tools based on teaching. That's the wrong perspective. Mm -hmm. Always focus on learning. Yeah. yeah I, I think of the same, just to back up what he's talking about. The issue of contexts matter. If, if we design a particular product and we want it to fit everyone, then we are lying to ourselves. Just like the, the same shoe cannot fit all of us, the shoe is important, but please look at my context and understand what it is that I will desire and what it is that I can utilize it for. A couple more questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. My name is Edward. Uh, I'm a program manager from an NGO in Kenya. Um, I'm running a program, a project called Online Safety. I appreciate a lot uh, that the uh, technology in education has done a lot. But I would like to know what is being done or what do you think will be done to ensure that our children are safe while they are using internet. So that's a big a big, a big question across. Yes, it's good, it's doing a lot to them. But again, they are getting attacked, especially online child sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my question two will be, um, internet is good, but skilling creativity. Every time you give a, out an assignment, students run to internet, they copy paste, change a few words, 
gets the assignment back to you. And that kills creativity. What happens to, to that? So who'd like to tackle any of those? We haven't heard from you two for a little while, so I'm going <laughs> to... Uh, I think teaching creativity is a little bit difficult for me because um, first we have to be creative. Teachers have to be creative. And um, unless we could be creative, we cannot teach creativity to the students. And um, as for internet, it's the same. So um, with the internet, we can use Skype or other tools and it's very useful. But unless teachers don't know how to use it safely, we can't teach children how to use it safely. So firstly, um, we should learn about mm -hmm. using that. But just to dig into that a little bit more, um, I think now, you know, it, in terms of leadership, uh, whether that's within a school, university, whatever it might be, having that digital skill set is really essential and really, you know, will help your trajectory in that way. Um, I'm just interested to know also, um, how did you go about equipping your, yourselves with that digital skill set or, or consciousness of, you know, making sure that you, ha you were aware of digital tools and what they could do? Um, and was any part of that kind of carved out in your timetable or did you take it on for yourselves? Uh, um, as for me, I read some books about teaching digital technology or I sometimes took um, MOOCs, mm -hmm. massive online open courses, to learn about myself. And that was all in your own time or in the school's time? My own time, of course. <laughs> How about yourself, Mary? Same for me, uh, my own time. I learned in YouTube videos, yep. <laughs> <laughs> tutorials, a lot of tutorials. Yeah. Yeah. I learned for myself to programming, QR, and Unity. But we need that skills. Uh, we need that right now, not in the future. <laughs> the world already changed. It's not coming change, already is that, changed. Is that a continuing theme this end as well? <clears throat> it's in your own time or what's yeah. the kind of... It, it is on my time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just did it on my own. And but I didn't go into reading. I dived into the sea. I just took whatever device I find. I try it. I, know the, I just know one thing. There is a button that I can <laughs> click on, and it says redo. So I knew I'll be safe. I just kept on redoing. Maybe to, to talk about what he's talked about mm -hmm. on issues of safety online. Mm -hmm. I want to give the analogy of a knife in the kitchen. Uh, children will interact with the knife. It's not the knife that is bad. Yeah. Mm. It is how they will interact yeah. with the knife. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. The knife can kill, the knife can cut them, yep. the knife can be very useful in cutting the meat and whatever it is that you want to use it in the kitchen for. So I don't want us to blame technology, I don't want us to blame, to blame it on that, on that yeah. perspective. It is how we will introduce it to our learners. Unfortunately, we might decide we want to block them from, from this and we say we don't want them to see this, we don't want them to see that. Mm but they will still access through their friends, through their contemporaries, through other people. And it is better for us just to tell them and uh, introduce them to what it is that is safer for them to do and what is not safe for them to do. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we've got one more question. Yeah, my question is a direct follow-up to uh, uh, what you just said. Uh, so it's a great, a great segue there. Uh, my name is Pablo, I'm the Chief Executive of uh, Clue Education. During the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, we've been hearing that um, basically the solution to the problem of uh, the use of technology in the classroom is more, right? You just need more money, more resources, more technology. If you throw more money, resources, and technology into the classroom, somehow a solution will be cooked and will come out. As it turns out, in, uh, you know, I've been the CEO of a, of a premium school group uh, where re resources were not the issue. And we found out that the, um, for instance, if, you know, if every child uh, runs around with his own uh, 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 laptop or, or tablet uh, and there is full connectivity in the school and so on, that is not necessarily a good thing um, because that exposes children to you know, all sorts of potential distractions that they're no, not, not, not prepared to cope with. Uh, oftentimes, teachers are also not prepared to manage the, the potential distractions that that introduces. So it, 
you know, it appears that with experience, we are learning that more is not necessarily better. So um, I would be thrilled to hear, you know, your views on how to thread that thin uh, midway, uh, you know, to find to benefit from the, as you said, you know, technology cuts both, both ways. Obviously, the chances of technology are amazing, but how to avoid the downside? How to, you know, to find that uh, that that uh, middle middle way? Uh, you know, famously, Steve Jobs, uh, you know, the 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 inventor of the iPad, if you will, he wouldn't allow his children to use iPads. <laughs> Right. Uh, so, so how, how how do you see how, how do you thread that uh, mm. that uh, uh, pluses and minuses of technology mm. in the classroom? I think a good framework <coughs> is uh, the foreign balance uh, framework, which states that it all starts with a good vision, the vision of the school, the school leaders, and then you have to train the teachers how to use it properly. And in most cases, they are skipping this step, which is very important. Train the teachers how to use the technology in the right way based on, on the right pedagogy and not just connecting it with certain content, you know. And when it comes to drawbacks like fake news and cyberbullying, this has been there for ages, you know. Fake news is not new because of internet. Um, and that's exactly why we need to use this technology. So we have, so we can, uh, so we can teach our students in a, in a safe environment how to use this technology. Yes. So how to deal with fake news? This has, be, this has to be part of the curriculum as well. Yeah. There's an interesting one as well though, isn't it? Because I mean, certainly in the UK, there is um, you know, a lot of talk about um, budgets as well. Mm -hmm. And so you know, schools having limited budgets. And um, I just wondered uh, across the panel and across the panelists here, um, whether you have experience, you know, where you feel it's like an extreme budget cut and, you know, what that's meant in terms of uh, using ed tech or, or conversely, does it mean that you actually have that kind of frugal uh effect? So does it make you more innovative because you have to be a bit more savvy about how you're using your ed tech? Not, not budget, but um, about two years ago, I, you know, I used Skype or Zoom or in some connecting tools, but it was blocked. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not budget, but I was very shocked to the fact. But I know that students loved communicating through Skype or Zoom or other country. So I had to bring my own Wi-Fi to the school. Wow. And I have to pay by myself. And it, it was a little bit hard for me, actually. But um, so but when, when that happened, did you have an interesting com conversation with your network manager in the school, or how did that work? <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> so or was it just like covert and yeah, <laughs> close the door? Actually, I often sneaked into the computer lab around after five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> this is brilliant. <laughs> um, so hopefully, they're not watching now. And, uh, you know, it's just our little secret in the room. Yeah. So, but yeah, I love my students smiling while communicating with other students in the foreign country. So it was actually the last year that finally using Skype and using Zoom or Pia.in was allowed to use in my school after I was nominated to the top 50 teachers. <laughs> okay, brilliant. I think we've got a question just here and then we'll take a few more. Um, we've got five minutes there. Hello, um, my name's Susie Crowder um, and I'm from a charitable organisation called Bright Futures in Guernsey, the Channel Islands. Uh, my first observation is um, perhaps we need to be um, rethinking the teacher training curriculum. So, for example, the people that are going through the PGC training today to be the teachers of tomorrow, um, I don't see any digital preparation work going in there. And if we're not preparing the teachers today for teaching tomorrow, what does that mean for the next generation and the next generation after that? Because aren't we really supposed to be preparing the young people for life and the world of work? both of which are coated heavily now with technology in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Just an observation. The second thing, comment I'd just like to sort of put out to you guys is um, how can organisations like mine, a, um, a foundation that my family have set up, help you to do what you're best at? Um, and how can the third sector generally, or the private sector generally, sort of stand with you shoulder to shoulder to help fill some of those gaps or bridge some of those gaps? I, um, in, in my case, uh, when I 
talk with my colleagues about these topics, about augmented reality, virtual reality, tablets, uh, QR codes. They look at me like, <laughs> what is talking yeah. about? No one understands about this. But our students uh, use it all days, this technology, uh, his cell phones, the internet, uh, social media. But we need support uh, in teaching all our teachers about this technology, about this advance. And the most important, the technology changes every day. So if we make a, um, a support about Facebook, about mm -hmm. Instagram, <laughs> tomorrow the technology is an other thing. So we always are behind the technology. We need to make something with your support who uh, uh, about um, help us today, not tomorrow. Today we need your help. It's making more responsive teacher mm -hmm. training. Yes. OK, we've got one more question at the back. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I want to make quickly two observations. The first one has to do with the role that policies can make in enabling the use of technology in the classroom. Um, technology as it is is a very good teaching aid, but if we do not have clear policies at the national level and then at the school level, its use become a game. A game that's not related to learning, but just how people use it. Uh, to ensure that it's being used effectively as a teaching aid, then there's a need for a national level policy mm -hmm. and a school level policy. So to the panel, how does that play in your various countries? Secondly, without effective training of teachers to be able to use the technology as a teaching aid, teachers are scared or reluctant to use the technology yes. because their learners are ahead of them mm -hmm. in terms of technology <coughs> use. So how do you see your take on this? Do you think teachers need to be trained before technology is given to them, or technology should be given to them before they are trained? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think that um, in, in Belgium, teachers are trained for three years, uh, basically. And many of those, their first uh, concerns are order in classroom, time management, meeting the curriculum, assessment. And some of the teachers will keep on teaching uh, as they do during the first year, which is focusing on 90% on or 99% of direct instruction. And then some of them, the most innovative ones, dare to take a jump and they will start using technology. So um, I think we need to explain to them in a very early stage how to use this and, and by training, offering good training and, and offering good practices as well. So teachers can, can learn from their colleagues as well. Yeah. I'm conscious we've got 15 seconds left. So what I'm going to do very, very quickly, I know that I asked you before, any people, books, uh, things that have really influenced you on this journey, if we can share those super quickly, 10, 10 to 15 seconds each. Okay, so right now there are two alleys in, the, in education. Those who believe in problem-based uh, education and student-centered learning, and those who believe in, in uh, direct instruction for 100%. And I think like the UK is really going to that way from direct instruction, and, and Canada and India is going to problem-based so, uh, so learning, and etc. And I'm in this alley, but I really love to read about the other uh, research, and I really love Donald Clark's blog. Mm -hmm. uh, he's having about, he's talking about myths, like uh, the fact that Ken Robinson school uh, kills uh, creativity. That's a myth, and that's really provocative. But I think you all need to l uh, read about these kind of subjects. Yeah. So challenging our echo chamber yeah. way of thinking. Yeah. Okay, Abdi. Um, I wouldn't talk about books, but I'll talk about people. I, I will say my teachers and the teachers who are passionate, because I usually talk of teachers in three categories, teachers by choice, teachers by accident, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and teachers by birth. 
So, so the, the teachers by choice are, are the ones who encourage me, and I think that will be the solution to all the problems we are talking about. The teachers do not need to know about technology. They need to be teachers first um, so that they can help the students, and they will push themselves towards learning and becoming, uh, becoming far better. Okay. Um, I would like to share two books. Can I share the title? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So one book is a, a, book, um, a book called Social Media, um, written by Jennifer Cassatot. And this is, um, you can learn how students can behave well in the digital world online and how they can use the online platform or how they can use the smartphone in the classroom very well. And the other book is um, Connection-Based Learning. Um, written by Sean Robinson, who, was, who is the, one of the top 50 teachers of Global Teacher Pro this year. And I love this book right, very now because um, you can learn how connection between students and parents, students and teachers, and students to students can work very well. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Well, I can recommend two books. Uh, first of all is Teach Like a Pirate. <laughs> we, need, we need innovation in the classroom and uh, digital natives because our students change, our different students. So we need to understand our students and we need to understand we need innovation in the classroom. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Can we give our panelists a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks everyone for listening. If you're interested in events coming up, here's one for your diary. Future EdTech takes place on the 11th and 12th of June in London. It's free for higher ed peeps uh, and everyone else can use the code PODCAST20 to get a nice discount. So go and check out all the details at www.theedtechpodcast.com. That's all for now. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Do feel free to follow us at Podcast EdTech. And see you next time. Bye-bye.